when I was younger. I would look at someone being successful at a given field mm. and almost automatically assume that they must have been always in a good shape. It wasn't the case of me starting coaching and then overnight becoming like the, the guy. It was a very, very slow process. I started at 20 pounds per session. I had a full coaching practice. So I had 20 clients before I felt it was right for me to put my fees up. Wow. Because mind you, I didn't have any coaching training. Yep. I didn't have I didn't have any formal coaching experience. I didn't feel it was right. With all my fucking confidence and bravado that I've always had, yep. coaching was new to me. I didn't feel it was right for me to experiment basically on my first clients. Yeah even at 50 pounds per session, let alone 100 pounds per session, let alone like thousands of pounds per program, right? You want to understand what I did when I first started, yeah. where I lived, how I did what I did, not to look at what I do and how I do it now. Welcome back everyone to the Coaching Masters podcast. And we are here today with Michael Serra and I am so, outrageously excited about this. Liam, why don't you say what you really think? You know, <laughs> why, why are you holding back? <laughs> you know? I, and then, no need to be shy, just fucking, you know. Goes, I never hold back, super excited, <laughs> super passionate. When I first became a coach, mm -hmm. you were one of the first coaches that I found online. And I thought, how do I do that? Right, that's what I'm aiming for. This is what I'm trying to create. And I was very inspired by you, Michael. You know, I became a coach January 1st, 2017. I read about that, yeah. And uh, and I was really inspired by you. But just before we dive into all of that, mm. the Coaching Masters community, our listeners, they're used to a few fucks, they're used to a few shits, they're used to a right. few bullshits. I can't hold it back myself. I'm very passionate about what I do and it just comes out, right? Fantastic. You be you, Michael. You be you, that's, that's what- You don't I'm need to ask here. me twice, Liam. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Of I appreciate course. it. Of course. Anytime, anytime. Let's do this. Let's do this. So before we get into what it, what is I just spoke about in terms of me being inspired by what you've created thus far, yeah. I would love to go back to the beginning, wherever the beginning is for you. So wh when I say that, Michael, let's go back to the beginning. What do you immediately think of? Born and raised in Poland. Um, very regular childhood, if you will. We were poor, but because everyone around us was just as poor, I didn't mm. feel like I was poor. Only now looking back, like, yeah, that was a poor fucking family, right? Yeah. But very loving and supportive parents. And when you think about it, what else could you ask for as a kid, right? Mm. And I mentioned that because I strongly believe that in order to be successful in a profession of coaching, personal coaching, yeah, well, you gotta make sure you have your shit together, yeah. first and foremost, right? So uh, I've done a lot of work on myself. I've been doing personal development for 17 years now, but without a doubt, I'm very aware of that, mm. how I had a good, strong starting point, which came from having those loving and supporting parents, right? Mm -hmm. That's not to say that if you experience trauma in your childhood, you can't become a great therapist or a coach or anything like that. Of course you can, it's just, you just need to do work on that and, and sure enough, if you do enough work on that, you're gonna be fine and get to the point I was at when I started coaching. Um, so, you know, very smart kid in primary school and, you know, went to one of the best high schools in my city, one of the biggest cities in Poland and everybody was expecting me to be a doctor lawyer because, you know, my grades in primary school would indicate that I could do that, right? Mm -hmm. But then when I was in high school, I realized that in order to get good grades in here, I have to fucking study. <laughs> and I had absolutely no interest in that. Yeah, yeah. And as smart as I was, uh, sure enough, if you don't study in high school, the grades will reflect that. And, sure. and I didn't have a bad time in high school because socially I was very good. I was like friends with everyone, including teachers, but like the grades were shit. And more than anything, if I have like the biggest memory from high school, it was the feeling of boredom. Mm. What the fuck am I doing here? What is going on? Mm. I mean, those people are lovely, but like, I have no interest in those topics. Yeah. The fucking chemistry and biology and history, I don't care, right? I was really into arts, playing instruments and, you know, discovering girls. Yeah. Those are the things I was interested in, sure. right? Not so much parties and drugs, just yet, that came later, right? <laughs> so it's not like, I just wanted to sit on my ass, smoke weed and play computer games. That wasn't the case. I was curious about people. I was curious about things, but I wasn't interested in the topics that mm. 
that they were teaching. So sure enough, um, at 17, I quit this high school. And I remember before walking out, and it's not like I had a fallout with the teacher or somebody was bullying me. It was a very peaceful decision, mm. right? Mm. But I remember vividly just before walking out, I knew that the, the bell's gonna ring, right? I'm gonna walk out of this school and I will never again go to another school ever again of any kind, right? Yeah, yeah. Not because I'm like against education, feel like that. I just felt it, mm. right? And at the time I thought maybe this is just like, you know, a feeling of a 17 year old. Let's see how that's gonna play out. I felt very convinced in my decision. But now looking back, I can see 23 years later, I can see clearly how certain I was already at 17 wow. on the importance of following one's voice, That's really right? Interesting. And, and being true to yourself. Yeah. Now, let me tell you this. In Poland or Eastern European countries in general, unlike the US or even the UK, no one quits school at 17. Wow. Nobody okay. does that. It's unheard wow. of. I've never heard, I've never met or heard about a Polish person who at least didn't graduate high school. Wow. Or like a technical equivalent of high school. See, that's so interesting. Nobody does that's that. That's so different to the UK when totally. you get everybody totally. said, oh, I left school at 15. Totally. Yeah. Richard 16. Branson and like, <clears throat> I think two or three out of Dragons and Dragons yeah. there, I quit school at 16. And nobody's like, wow, okay, that's. That's unusual. Yeah, so, so you can imagine, like I didn't give a shit, right? I didn't do it to like fucking, uh, uh, you know, make a statistic, right? And, and be different. I wasn't, I wasn't being rebellious. Yeah. I was being true to myself. I was mm -hmm. being authentic, right? But sure enough, my loving, but at the same time conservative, relatively conservative parents almost got a fucking heart attack. <laughs> because they were just, but you, you know, I, I will never forget it, you know? It wasn't that they were upset, they were upset as well. But they were scared in a sense that they thought that maybe I've lost it. Mm. Like that I've lost it. Because people I, didn't do that. No, it was, it, they've never seen anything like that, wow. right? The only people in Poland who do not graduate from high school or the equivalent of high school are people who are too fucking stupid to do so. Right. And sure enough, like I, I wasn't stupid. So it's like, yeah. what, what the hell? Like Quite the opposite, you know, my yeah, smart, like, what's going on? One of the smartest kids in primary school, right? And like, you know, teacher's favorite in fucking mm. high school, you know, very vocal, like school theater, playing guitar, you know, trying to pick up girls with my longer fucking hair. Didn't really work out. <laughs> yeah, but I was trying, right? It's so like everybody knew who I was. Mm. So everybody was shocked, right? So, so my parents understand me went, okay, should we try to find another school? Mm. You know, maybe private school, even though they didn't have the money, but they're like, we're gonna take loans to put you in a private school. I said, guys, the school was perfect. Yeah. I had no problem with this particular school, right? It's yeah. just the traditional educational system, whatever. Anyway, one of the things that my parents um, did, which even at the time at 17, I had a strong sense of fairness around that. And now, you know, 23, year, 23 years later, I have even more sense of fairness around that decision. Mm -hmm. They said, Okay, after they kind of accepted that it's just not gonna happen for me education wise. Okay, you're gonna have to make your own money mm. from now on. Yeah. They didn't kick me out of the house, but say, okay, you're not gonna get any money from us. Yeah. So sure enough, from the age of 17, one way or another, I had to make my own money. Mm, interesting. Right? Yeah. Which by the time I came to London at 22, when I could legally work here after Poland joined European Union, right? That's the reason why it took me so long oh, because hey, before like you, you couldn't, you could come as a tourist. Yeah but you wouldn't get a job, a legal job, because obviously the, the system was different. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, the five years before quitting, uh, between quitting school and coming here, moving to London at 22, trying different things, you know, coming here for a few months, but working illegally uh, for like two pounds an hour, you know, 14 hour shifts in a fucking mm -hmm. kitchen and, you know, going to Holland and working, you know, cutting fucking pipes in the greenhouse and, <laughs> you know, teaching English in Poland, even though I could barely speak English, but I knew the basics very well. And that was like my first hassle, you know? Because wow. I did quite well teaching English on an individual basis to like total beginners, Yeah, yeah. right? So, so then at, at 22, I find myself on the bus uh, to London, 27 hour bus journey. All the money I had was just enough to buy two one way bus tickets, right? For me and my girlfriend at the yeah, time. Yeah. I had to drag her with me. She didn't want to come, but I said, listen, I'm going anyway. <laughs> and obviously she loved me more, 
then she hated idea of moving countries. So she wow. came, she followed me and she's still here. She's still here. She's still alive. Yes, she's still. <laughs> so, so, so then the question is how the fuck you could come here without any money um, mm. on the bus because you couldn't afford the plane tickets. I had a couple of friends living here already and they said very nice people. Yeah. Who I've known for like years, but they were in London, in London already and said, you guys come in, we're going to lend you money. Yeah. You're going to get jobs. You're going to pay us back. And that's exactly what happened. Right. So she got a job in retail. I got a job in retail. Mm. So that's me at 22 working my ass off because you see when I was on that bus for 27 hours, surrounded by Polish people drinking vodka and eating fucking gherkins, right? <laughs> like a stereotypical, right? <laughs> You know, all the things in my bags, everything of any fucking value I owned was in the fucking bags, right? Yeah. So it wasn't like just one or two carrier bags. It was just like fucking all the bags that I had and the same for my, my ex. So there was no money mm. to my name. I could barely speak English, but I knew I'm going to make it. Like the mindset was there. You obviously you understand the importance yeah. of mindset. Like the mindset was there. The hunger was there. Mm. The balls were there. Yeah. Obviously, there was a display of ballsiness at 17 already. Yeah. And between the age of 17 and 22, all sorts of things happened in different countries. So if anything, I was nowhere the kind of man. I wasn't a man yet, but mm. I was definitely ballsy for, for my yeah. age, right? And the balls had grown between 17 to 22. To You're getting even more balls. Totally, totally. <laughs> Every year, I'm like, fucking now, will that ever stop? <laughs> you know, it's like, am I having a medical condition now? It's like the, si the size of those balls, right? I'm going to need a wheelbarrow for fuck, those balls. Fuck, fuck. People, people go like, girlfriends for the first time, like, Jesus, what happened? You know, I said, this, this, I don't know. Yes. They were like, we, we thought you only have a big head. I said, no, 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 everything is in proportion. Right, so, so I'm on this bus, hungry. I had no clue how I'm going to make money, how I'm going to become successful in which field, but I knew I will eventually. Yes. Not necessarily that my first job is going to be it. Mm, and I had, I had no idea about coaching at the time. So it's not like, oh, I'm so fucking smart. On the bus at 22, I already knew that at, at you know, um, at 28, I'm going to launch a coaching business and this coaching business is going to become the best. No, I didn't think that far. No, no, no. no. The first few years were about number one, survival, and number two, about figuring out what is it that I want to do, right? Mm. Which vehicle I'm gonna use to become successful. Mm. And sure enough, and this was one of the, the most important parts of, of like my life story, how around a year in, I come back home from work one day, and my ex, the one I dragged to, to London with me, mm. she was reading this book called The Secret. Okay. And prior to this point, I've had interest in psychology, psychiatry even, but not personal development. I wasn't familiar with the, with the field of personal development at all. But anyway, long story short, I got curious, I read The Secret, and I got into personal development, mm. right? And personal development, while I was working in fashion retail, very successful career there, but I use that as an example. Mm. And I think many people can relate to that. I was winning, Liam. Yes. But I was winning in the wrong game. Yeah, uninspired, <clears throat> I believe, is a, a term that you use to describe that time yeah. in fashion. It was uninspiring, right? Mm. Great people, some shit people, but some lots of great people as well. And I was doing well because, you know, I was smart enough. I was working my fucking ass off. I'm reliable and I'm likable for the most part and trustworthy, right? So it wasn't that fucking hard mm. to be good at retail, right? Sure. But, you know... I like to be in rooms where I'm the, the least successful, the least smart, yeah. the least good looking, yes. right? like I am today. Fuck you, Leo, right? <laughs> Not to be like, oh my God, like I feel superior to, you know, it, it, it doesn't do it for me. I, I get it. Where, where's, where's, get where's the growth? I'm yeah. saying where? that all the time. I'm where's always saying to the community, I want to be the stupidest, yeah. I want to be the least successful, yeah. least interesting, l worst looking person in that room, because yeah. otherwise, how are you going to level up? Yeah, totally. And, and, it, and it's you know, part of this, like I'm, I'm going, um, like that's, you know, further down the story. But mm. um, when I became a coach and I started doing well, I found myself feeling that I was, after a few years, feeling that I was the most successful person on my street or like mm. in my area in sure. Southeast London where sure, I used to live. Sure. And then sure enough, when I moved to Mayfair in 2014, I was like, yeah, I'm the poorest motherfucker here. <laughs> <laughs> and I fucking loved it. Best position to be. I was in. like, I'm fucking poor. <laughs> I was the, I was the big shock because I remember like, the guys, the moving company that I've used, those two Polish guys. Obviously, it's a moving company, must be Polish, right? <laughs> so they took my staff. They came with this van. They picked my staff from my southeast London place, 
very nice place. I kept it clean, you know, I'm OCD, but like yeah. very fucking modest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah on a very modest street in a very modest area, right? Yeah. And we move into this fucking penthouse in Mayfair. Yeah. And I'll never forget it, this main guy, when he entered the place, I was already inside, he entered the place, like my living room, he looked around like this, and he just went in Polish, he went, Michael, that's quite a leap. <laughs> because yeah. usually when people move up, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like you go from steps. shitty area to like average, then like it's, and then you just like maybe one day you end up in Knightsbridge or fucking. Usually. And I just went like I, I've paced myself, I've paced myself because I had this idea. Mm. I wanted to be Mayfair, and I knew I wanted to be Mayfair long before I could afford Mayfair, right? Yeah. But anyway, so coming back to like the, the you know the, the secret, I go to the personal development, and. While I was working in retail for another few years, that was something that I was very much involved in my spare time, mm. reading books, um, learning about confidence in general, as well as with women, because mm. that was important mm. for me as well, right? Like I've never been terrible with women, but yeah. I was maybe average and average at anything for me is like shit, right? Sure. Then spirituality, um, then, uh, you know, not really actively looking for something that I could do professionally to the point where it would lead me to discovering coaching. It was actually made a little bit easier for me. Mm. Coaching, it felt like it discovered me mm. at 28. Mm. So I'm in retail for six years and then I'm watching a YouTube video, someone on the stage talking about personal development, knowing that this person is a coach. It just fucking clicked. And I had this aha moment. I felt high, <clears throat> excuse me, I felt high for like three days. I was yeah. like, fuck me. Yeah. It was like an equivalent of the love from the first side, which I've never experienced, yeah. but I've experienced that love from the first side yeah. professionally, right? And I'm so grateful for it. And sure enough, it's been 11 and a half years now, and that feeling has never left me. One thing you said there that I find really interesting is that it found you, yeah. coaching found you. Yeah. And I just really and truly understand that it showed itself to you at a time where you really, really needed it. Yeah. Why do you think it did that? Why did coaching show itself to you? I know, I know exactly why. And I had this suspicion, but now I can see because I'm fucking made for it. Yeah, yeah. I have so many weaknesses. There's so many, so many things I can't do, such as driving, cooking, like even basic stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. Being nice to girls, I'm struggling with that, right? <laughs> uh, but fuck me, in the context of personal coaching, yeah, I can maximize all my natural strengths mm. and I don't need to worry about all my, or most of my natural weaknesses. Yeah. And the few weaknesses that I need to worry about, I can outsource easily to other people. There are many things I admire about mm -hmm. you, Michael. And one of them, if it's okay to share, sure. is conviction. Mm. That really is a word that I just see highlighted mm. all around you. And that sense of conviction and the, the story that you share, it was there mm. even way back when you made the decision, school is not for me. I know mm. there's another way. In Poland where nobody did that, nobody left school. That sense of conviction how important is that to you to, to hold on to that and have that? We could we could talk about the importance of it. Uh, and I appreciate you, you when you were speaking, you were thinking about it in a more general terms, not just in a context of me being a coach, yeah. right? Um, you as a person. Totally. And I believe it's I believe it's hugely important, right? And and here is the thing, it's not something you need to the way I see it, it's not something that one has to learn necessarily. If anything, you need to unlearn mm -hmm. all the reasons that you think of as to why you shouldn't be convinced, mm. right? And for example, I date a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm single by choice, I date a lot, right? Yeah. And I'm sure, and I, and I do pretty well, mm -hmm. not because I'm so fucking exceptional necessarily, objectively speaking, but because I think I'm exceptional subjectively speaking, number one. And number two, I, I put a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Like sure. I, I work harder in this area than most guys. Yeah. And sure enough, my results are better than most guys, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm sure, this is where I'm going with this, I'm sure at least some people assume when they see me with the girls I go out with, like, wow, oh, that's because he's rich. Sure. Or because he lives in Mayfair, right? Or because he looks like half decent, right? What they don't know is that, first of all, 
I was already successful in a, in a dating arena long before I've made the money yep. and moved to Mayfair, yep. right? And I know that because I remember that. And equally, if anything, my looks were better in my 20s and I was fucking useless. Mm. So I know it's not about the looks, I know it's not about the money. Yeah. It's about more than anything about that conviction, yes. right? You know, as I said to you before we started rolling, like, you know, when you think you are the shit, yeah. guess what? People will, not everybody, but people will like, probably there's a reason why he or she is like that, yes. right? Yeah. And, and this is not to say that, as I said before, there's so many things I'm not good at. And I have so many weaknesses and flaws. Mm. And I can be such a fucking nightmare to be around because I'm controlling, I have a hugely dominant personality and yeah. it suits some people and it really doesn't suit some other people, yeah. right? Like I literally tell my girlfriends like what to wear, what not to wear and like make conditions and, and it's non-negotiable. I said, listen, if, if like I had this girlfriend, she fucking loved hair extensions and us being together, spending more time together was conditional on her not wearing hair extensions because that's how I feel about hair extensions and I wasn't willing to compromise. Sure. And now using that as, a, as, a, as an example, this could apply to all areas of life. Most guys would think what I thought about hair extensions, which is like fucking, uh, it's like plastic basically for the most part, yeah, you know? unless yeah. they're like really high quality, right? Yeah. And they would have a problem with it in a similar way. I have a problem with it, but I would say it, whereas they would only think it. Mm. And they wouldn't say it because they would think, fuck, if I tell her that, she won't want to see me again. Mm. Whereas in my mind is, I choose myself. Sure. Like my, my needs come first. I take care of myself first, mm. whether it's my clients or people I date or people in my life in general. It starts with me. Yes, I'm in a profession that is designed to help people, but I help people on my terms. Sure, if sure. you want to work with me, mm. this is how it's gonna look like. You don't get to choose how many sessions we're gonna have. Mm. You're certainly not gonna choose how much you're gonna pay me for it. Mm, sure. And you're certainly not gonna fucking tell me to coach you at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm a fucking sleep at eight <laughs> o'clock, for example, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> and sure enough, when you operate from that place, mm. not everyone, but most people are happy to play ball. For sure, yeah, you've created the structure and people can fit inside of the structure. Yeah, and they need to. And it's like, I never I never put pressure on anyone to either work with me or to go on another date with me. It's like, listen, I gave you my fucking best. That's in my head. It's like, yep. take it or leave it. Or you don't want to see me again. You don't want to work with me. That's fine. And what I don't say, but I think it's like, it's your loss. Sure, of you course. Know? One, one thing I've always been dying to ask you ever since knowing about you from years ago is mm. how does Michael Serra go from becoming a coach mm -hmm. and making that decision, this is a new career path for me. I'm going to explore this. I'm going to become a coach to becoming the coach with such a level of conviction that says, I only work with individuals of a certain stature for a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. It's exclusive, it's elite. It really is like top of the food chain type of coaching. Sure. What, what happens in between those two things to oh, create that? Sure, great question. So many people when, uh, I, I, I suppose I've been guilty of it myself. Um, when I was younger, I would look at someone being successful, uh, successful at a given field mm. and almost automatically assume that they must have been always mm. in a good shape or always good with the opposite sex or the same sex, if you can. Uh, always uh, find it easy to make money, mm. right? Always having great manners and sophistication, right? And sure enough, that's really the case, mm. right? So to come, you know, coming back to your question, it certainly wasn't the case of me starting coaching and then overnight becoming like the, the guy. It was a very, very slow process. I started at 20 pounds per session. Interesting. You can imagine Interesting. what sort of people you're gonna attract yeah. at 20 pounds per session in the UK. If you charge 20 pounds per session in fucking Kenya, you're probably like the highest paid, right? But like in this country, like you know the average yeah. price of coaching, right? Yeah. I had a full coaching practice, so I had 20 clients before I felt it was right for me to put my fees up. Wow. Because mind you, I didn't have any coaching training. Yep. I didn't, had, I didn't have any formal coaching experience. I didn't feel it was right. With all my fucking confidence and bravado that I've always had, yep. this was new to me. Mm -hmm. So just because I was already a cocky little shit in fashion retail and I 
had a successful career there and I just about to knew how to talk to girls by then. Mm. Coaching was new to me. And I didn't feel it was right for me to experiment basically on my first clients, yeah. even at 50 pounds per session, let alone 100 pounds per session, let alone like thousands of pounds per program, right? Yeah. So 20 pounds for a few months, 50 pounds per session for like six months, 75 pounds per session. So basically I started at 20 pounds per session. Wow. And since then I've doubled my fees 10, 11 times. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I always felt it's never been, it's never been the case of, rightly or wrongly, it's never been the case of planning to put my fees up from like the 1st of January or the 1st of fucking July. Yeah. I would sometimes be having a consultation, initial consultation with someone and I would just feel that it's time to ask for more money. I would just wow. feel it. And I, would, so and, I would, and I would just be true to myself. Like, okay, I'm fucking ready. Mm. I know that I can ask for more money right now and I have enough confidence to know that this is justified. Yes. Because one thing that I've always had a problem with, with the idea of maybe ripping people off is maybe a you know, strong way of putting it, but, but overcharging people, mm. right? So now I'm, I'm well aware that nobody in the UK, to the best of my knowledge, charges as much as I do, mm. but I'm also aware that I ask for this 10, 20, 30K for coaching with the same amount of ease I used to ask for 20 pounds. Yeah. Because I've elevated myself, you know, but I to your original that. question, it's been a long fucking process. So to yeah. anyone listening who are, you know, already coaches or think about coaching, it's not a good idea mm. to look at someone like myself or someone like myself, you know, five years in, since I started and be like, okay, Michael Serra is charging, you know, 3K, I'm gonna charge. Michael Serra wasn't charging 3K when he first started. So you want to look, if you are new to coaching, if anything, if you are, you know, even remotely interested in modeling yourself on someone like me, mm. you want to understand what I did when I first started, yeah. where I lived, how I did what I did, not to look at what I do and how I do it now, yeah, which is at a completely different level. I love that that's the story because mm. I, I didn't know whether or not it would be a gradual thing or would it, whether it was an immediate decision no. from day one. No. And that is so much more inspirational mm. because it's so much more relatable for everybody mm. listening to this to know you don't just start up here. You know, you just don't jump into that. I you do gradually not believe, build it yeah, up. I do not believe. So I'll give you an example. Uh, ben Affleck, and Matt Damon, uh, Good Will Hunting. I don't know if you saw that. Oh yeah. Oh, there you go. Amazing. I, I, I forgot what's your like background. Of course you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah of course. Actor. You'd be like, oh yeah, I was I was having a dinner with both of them yesterday. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, if I know Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, like, they're like my buddies. Uh, we play golf every fucking Saturday. So so Love so it. so yeah. So maybe you know how. Um, like you definitely know how they won an Oscar mm. for the script for the for the movie. And I think they were like 25 and 26, or so 24 yeah. and 26, right? Yeah. And somebody said, Matt, Di Matt Damon, who is Matt Damon? You know, like they wrote the script, they won an Oscar for it. They were both in the movie, obviously, right? Matt Damon, overnight success. And what people didn't know is that he spent 10 years waiting tables during the night, going to fucking shitty auditions, you know, doing some fucking toothpaste commercial, yep. really fucking struggling, right? Yes. And then, of course, we didn't hear about him before because who gives a fuck? Like, we don't hear about actors at that level because it's exactly. right because they're like invisible, right? Yeah. But I wouldn't say that it took me ten years to make it. Uh, it depends what we define as making it. I would I would define it as turning your coaching practice in, into a six figure practice, mm -hmm. right? Sure. So. So that took me two years, mm -hmm. right? Two yeah. years and a bit, right? So my second full year of coaching, I made 95K, it's so almost 100K, yep. right? But mind you, not only it was graduate, I haven't met, I've met some, including some of my mentees, right? I, I've met or worked with some very hardworking coaches, Yeah. but I would still argue, and this is not like, oh, look at me, I'm so hardworking, but you need to understand I'm Polish, right? Mm -hmm. Genetically, I'm wired to be, <laughs> Like, it's illegal for us to be lazy, right? Love it. It's like if the Chinese kid is not good in maths or playing piano, it's like, you can't live in this country. What you know? a great combo. The, hard the, working genes and conviction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and leading with your gut. I mean, geez, no and, wonder. And, be, and, and being half decent with people as well, right? So, <laughs> Definitely. So, 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 you know, like in retail, I was working hard, but because my heart wasn't in it, I wasn't like, 
you know, to my standards, mm -hmm. it was still better than everybody else or almost everybody else. But to my standards, like I knew I had more in the tank. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't, I just wasn't willing to fucking give it my all because yeah. it was just a job, sure. right? But when I made a commitment to become a coach or when the commitment was made for me, like when I, you know, heard the fucking voice, so to speak, and I yes. followed that path, it wasn't from day one, that would be an exaggeration, because day one was like, fucking hell, this is so exciting. Oh my God, I wanna do it. And I couldn't wait to coach. Mm. If I didn't find people willing to pay me 20 pounds per session, which wasn't that hard, yeah. I would do it for free. That's, much, that's how much I loved it, right? Yeah. I would do it now for free. I don't do it for free, but I would do it for free now sure. if I had to somehow, right? Because I love it so much, right? But here's the thing. Not day one, like I said, maybe day fucking 16. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, hmm, I really fucking love this. Mm. And also like, I remember the difference between how strongly I felt about it before I got my first coaching clients mm -hmm. and how much stronger I started to feel about it when I actually started coaching. Mm. It was a, a reinforcement, a confirmation that I'm, that I'm onto something there, yeah. right? So day 16 or whatever, 17, I thought to myself, hmm, looks like I'm gonna be doing this for the rest of my life anyway. Mm. I might as well be the best. Since I'm gonna be doing it anyway, wow. I might as well be the best. It's like when I'm in a relationship back in the day when I had like regular relationships. Mm. Well, I've I've left all the other girls for this one. I might as well be the best fucking boyfriend. I'm not saying that I was, but like yeah. I wasn't bad because no, because the because the conviction was like I'm gonna fucking try yes. and if you like commit yourself to something obviously sure enough you can get great results right so so that then led to me working harder at it mm. back in the day i don't yeah. work as hard because i don't have to anymore sure but back in the day working harder at it than any other coach i've ever I, and I sense that across. I, I fucking feel that I, I push myself so hard. I've done some crazy things. So mm. just to give you an idea, the first two and a half years. So from the moment I started to the moment of moving to like Mayfair, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was like, okay, I've made it. Yeah. Like I'm here now. Yeah. So two and a half year period, no exaggeration, right? Mm. Working seven days a week, mm. no days off. And I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me because I fucking loved every minute of it, yeah, right? Absolutely. The best two and a half years of my life. There's, yeah. you know, it's gonna sound like fucking hell, this guy has sacrificed a lot and oh my God, and he, he de it. deprived himself of, from this and that. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me because looking back, so far, the best two and a half years of my life. Wow. Even though I've worked seven days a week, the only days where I didn't do client facing work were like Christmases when mm. I would go to Poland for like two days. Yeah. But other than that, working seven days a week, client-facing work, um, no drinking, and I like to drink, no partying, and back then I, I, I used to like to party. Yeah. No dates. Right. I was single, and I didn't allow myself to even think about dating because I recognized that if there's one thing that can take my attention away mm -hmm. from my fucking mission, yeah. was dating. And sure yeah. enough, you know how it works, For sure. because I was so on the fucking mission, yeah. every time I would go into contact with a woman, but like, sweetheart, I'm fucking busy, you, you know? Because they were just like, you know, he yeah. doesn't want me. And it's not like because I don't want you, it's just like, fucking, you could distract me. Like, I can't yeah. I can't have that, right? Sure, sure. So, two and a half years of living pretty, pretty much like a monk. Wow. Um, making money, putting this money back in business, um, getting some coaching, business coaching, life coaching, whatever, you know, reading about it, and then, and then in 2012 alone, so my first full year of coaching, on top of my around 20 clients at any given time, up to 40 sometimes, and all the initial consultations that I had to have before they became clients. Yeah. <clears throat> in 2012 alone, I've organized and delivered around 200 talks as well. Wow. So like, I was, I was prepared to give a talk, little talk, you know, yeah. using meetup.com as a platform to, yeah. to, to organize it, right? Sometimes I will have 10 people showing up, sometimes I will have 15, 20, one time two people showed up, yeah. and I was like, okay, I have two people in the audience, I was charging two pounds per talk at the time, Yeah, yeah. right? Okay, I have one woman, one guy. Okay, today we're gonna talk about a fucking 45 minute speech, yeah. and I'm fucking going for it, and I'm pretty sure that at this one point, I caught this woman looking at me like, 
this guy's fucking crazy. And in my head, I was like, I am fucking crazy. I've always been crazy. I'm still crazy, right? But like, I believe that <laughs> yes. if you want conviction, if you want the greatest things that life has to offer, you have to be, you have to go about it in a crazy, obsessed, and what I mean crazy, obsessed way. You gotta get obsessed. This is, I knew this was gonna be inspirational, but mm. this is even more inspirational than what I thought it was gonna be because there was always a chance because I didn't know that this was the thinking behind getting you to where you are today. Sure. So there was always the Maybe chance. Maybe you thought I, I just, um, you know, he woke up one day. Yeah, I mean. You, and people just lined up. You could have said. I wish that was the case. Oh, I just made the decision I'd be yeah. the most expensive or I just made the decision mm. I'd be the most exclusive. But to know that there was this leading up to it and building up to it, step yeah. by step by step by step, charging two quid to go and do those talks, two yeah. people in the audience but you've got that much conviction that much passion that much drive mm. that you're gonna go and do it because you love it totally. the listeners are gonna love that because we can now see where you are and the listeners can think but michael's not always been there oh, he was also making two pound for a talk and there was two people in the audience so where i am right now in the very mm. beginning i'm exactly where i should be what, what does it take to be a client of yours um on the most basic level, one needs to be able to handle my personality. Yeah. Because the way I am with you today, I'm yeah. always the same way. Love it. I, I don't have like off days when I'm kind of more introverted. And that's not to say that's far from it, from being the truth. You don't need to be extroverted to be a successful coach. There are some successful coaches in America who are introverted as fuck, yeah. right? The kind of guys that you do this and they would get scared, <laughs> right? And that's okay. They have a different coaching style than sure. like a different clientele. I know that I might be the best coach for my clients, for people who choose to work with me, but at the same time, simultaneously, I'm the worst coach. I would be the worst coach for some other people. Yeah, so right? you've got to be able to handle the personality. Right, so, so like, I know that's not what, what your question was, but I think this is a very important point to, mm -hmm. point to make for anybody listening. Don't try to be like anyone, no matter how successful they are, you only have a shot at being very successful as a coach by making your coaching style to become an extension of your personality. Wow, love that. If I was to try to be introverted, first of all, it would look inauthentic, weird, or introverted, quiet, softly spoken, yeah. politically correct. First of all, I would come across as inauthentic because that's not who I am. Yes. And second of all, I would fucking hate it because there's nothing wrong with acting if you choose that as a career because I would have to act every day. For sure, yeah. I don't want to act. I want to show up and be like, hey, what's up? Yeah, it would feel the awful. It would feel, as you mentioned, inauthentic. It would feel, in my mind, it would feel twisted. It would feel tense. It would feel like you're under pr a totally. pressure you don't want to be under because you're pretending to be someone totally. else. Just be you. Totally. And then people will have an initial consultation with me. And then when you think about it, if your prospective client is confused as to who you are, where you're coming from, it, it applies the same way to fucking dating, right? When yeah. you go on a date and who is this person? Are they this or that? It's like, I'm confused. Like, I, I'm not sure if I can trust this energy, mm. right? And even with swearing, and again, if you don't swear on a day-to-day -day basis, don't start fucking swearing suddenly just because I said what I'm about to say. Yeah. But there's been several articles and studies showing how people who swear mm -hmm. tend to be coming across as more trustworthy. Mm, interesting, right? yeah. And I, my theory, how to, as you know, how to explain it, is like how I believe that everyone swears at the very least internally. Sure, interesting. So if you feel like saying, fuck's sake, but you don't say it, you're just being inauthentic. Yeah, you're putting a barrier up. Yes. Putting up a filter. Yeah, it just, it just it makes you, it makes you more relatable. Like I swear a lot, but it makes you relatable if you drop an occasional fucking shit here and there. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, okay, for sure. okay, okay, this person has emotions and they express those emotions, you know. Yeah, yeah, it, oh, there aren't all of these filters and barriers, exactly. so I actually know who this person is. Exactly, exactly. So, so, um, and, and, and again, this is not um, something that I started off with, like from day one. My website, the first version of my website looked like everybody else's website. Mm. The only point of difference, the only USP was that I was charging 20 pounds per session. Mm. And that's what got me all the clients I got because there was no real expression of personality because I didn't think that that was quote unquote allowed. Like, right. could I do that? Because nobody, nobody taught me that. No. But I remember one of my biggest discoveries, right? A year and a half in, so a year and a half running those talks and charging, you know, up to 100 pounds per session, etc. 
And then I had this aha moment when I concluded, when I realized that nobody was criticizing me. Mm. And I instantly went in my head, that's not good, is it? I need to, I, I'm playing it too safe. Interesting. Because I know my personality. Like I had fucking problems with like teachers sometimes and yeah. quitting that school. I've always been this person, but I wasn't, I've always been a maverick, but I wasn't expressing that in my coaching yeah. because I didn't think that that's go a, a good idea. Interesting. And I remember I ran this, I, that the discovery, that conclusion that I arrived to with a former client at the time who used to work in advertising, a successful advertising uh, executive, right? And I remember his name is Oli. Oli said, this is genius. What you're referring to is called a hook. We call it a hook in advertising, right? And that's how I became the no bullshit coach. Yeah. Because I've always been no bullshit in the way I am, yeah. right? From a very young age. But that wasn't expressed in my online communication. That wasn't expressed in, a, in my offline communication, mm -hmm. right? A little bit, but not to the full fucking extent. Yeah. yeah. And Liam, guess what fucking happened? when I went from saying the same things in the same way mm. to being myself and making my website sound pretty much, not, not, not as polished yet, yep. but making my website copy sound the way it sounds now, it wasn't like, yeah, I think there was like a 10% increase in the amount of inquiries. It was a fucking day and night. Wow. It was a day and night. You took the shackles off. Day and night. And not only, exactly, not only that I got more interest from the market, also, by becoming clearly clear as to what I am about, coming back to one of your original questions, I started to attract more of the my people, as I call them. Mm, absolutely. Right? And when you think about it, as a coach, <clears throat> do you really want to spend your time coaching people? Doesn't matter how much money they have. Doesn't matter how successful they are, right? How well respected they might be in the field. But if they're not your people, if you don't gel with them, it's like, again, I know I use lots of dating analogies, right? But like, that's like dating someone who's just attractive, but like you have no fucking chemistry. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Of course. Right? Of course. Especially given that my coaching sessions are on the longer side and all my clients have 20 percent access to me mm. uh, between sessions via WhatsApp, right? So there's a lot of communication. I don't want to receive a, a message from a client seeing the fucking name and have that feeling of like, oh my goodness. Definitely not. Definitely. Right? And, and I was going to touch on that as well. Yeah. In terms of the structure, you know, yeah. what, what is it that you do? What's your, <clears throat> excuse me, what, what's your approach to coaching when you work with your clients? Um, so I have my signature transformation programs. Mm. Uh, I work really fast. And one of the um, reasons or one of the things that allow me to work really fast is that I work with people who can meet me at that level of uh, productivity yeah. and pace, yeah. right? So I typically spend around four months with the client mm. and then 30% of the time, those people continue beyond four months and sometimes I work with people for you. I can't get rid of them sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's too fucking good. Uh, or they come back after a few years, you know, and you know, you know what, one of the things um, I often talk about is how, you know, when I, when I talk to my mentees, so like I have my, as I call them, civilian clients, mm. And that's around 80% of my clientele. Okay. And then 20% will be other coaches, okay. <clears throat> excuse me, who, who come to me at a different stages of their coaching career, right? Yeah. yeah. So I do my personal coaching, my civilian clients, and I do mentoring with, with other coaches, yeah. right? And um, with new coaches, this is typically 12 months, et cetera. It's a slightly different setup, right? Yeah. Um, but one of, the, one of the first things I say to my uh, uh, mentees, right? So other coaches that I work with, is how we are in a relationship business, not in a coaching business. Mm. We are in a relationship business and we use the vehicle of coaching to deliver the results for our clients, right? Sure. And when you think about it, if you are in it for the long run, if you want to have a very successful career, if you want to build a reputation, mm. of course it's about relationships. Why? Because your job implies working with people, yeah. right? So, yeah. so naturally the quality of the relationships you can build with your, with your clients will directly correlate to the level of success you can expect to, right? And, and, then, and then, you know, how do you build successful relationships? Well, first and foremost, people need to trust you, mm. right? So mm. sometimes at the end of the initial consultation, I would ask a prospective client whether 
between the online research, I always ask people to like heavily research me before the consultation, yes. yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can be an asshole about it. If someone is going to ask me, come for a consultation, and ask me like a basic question, I'll be like, listen, that was part of your homework. Yeah. You like, I'm not, that. like, you suddenly said, oh, so how did you get into coaching? And, you know, like, what are you from? Like, and I will have this facial expression as well. I'll be like, listen, um, I ask you, oh, but I didn't get to it. And I'm just like, mm -mm. I don't, I don't kick them out because that's made us like a like next level for me to kick them out of that. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Right? So I'm not like that, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm visibly. <clears throat> Mm. disappointed with yeah. them not following through on ve the, the very fucking thing I asked them to do. And you gotta set that precedent early. Yeah. It's gotta be <clears> from the beginning. And Liam, when you think about it, given that I deal almost exclusively at this point of my career, and this yeah. is the important distinction, is it hasn't always been that hasn't always been that way. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like now in the last few years, yeah. where the majority of my um, cl uh, prospective clients and then clients are people who are very successful, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. How often a CEO who runs a multi-million company is being told off, basically, <laughs> by a fucking service provider? Right. Not very often. Interesting. Right? When you're at that level, let's face it, it's like being a, a very pretty girl. Everybody wants to suck your dick, pretty much. Right? <laughs> yeah. And then this guy comes about, and he's like, I'm not sucking anybody's dick. <laughs> I'm not homophobic. It's just not something that I do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care who you are. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, and this is not a power thing. I'm not trying to, certainly I'm not trying to intimidate anyone in my house. People come to my house. I yeah, like to yeah. be the fucking best host I can be, yeah, right? Yeah. But if I ask you to do something mm. and you don't reply saying, oh, I can't do it and those are the reasons why I can't do it, I expect you to do it. And if yeah. you don't do it and I, and, you know, I find out about it, I'm not going to be very happy. And you're not serving them by being nice about that. You For know, sure. And tiptoeing around that because that's your structure. That's the way you work. That's the precedent that has to be set. Totally. And by doing that, you're serving them because then you know that the relationship is going to abide by those rules and then mm. you're going to be able to help them. Totally. Right? One way, one way to, to describe it is like, you know, having boundaries. Mm. Or it's like another example. Somebody comes in 20 minutes late. Oh, I'm running late for the initial consultation. Mm. I'm running late. Okay, see you soon. They come in. If they want, it's very rare, right? Mm. People are too scared to do it. Um, but when they come in and they, they, don't, they don't apologize, mm. and again, it could be a very successful person, I would ask them, so, you know, John, or whatever the name is, John, so before we start, can I ask you something? Um, is it normal for you to come 20 minutes late to meetings without an apology? Mm. Straight press. So you just, you straight, if they had yeah. any fucking yeah. doubts, right? And, th and this is usually people who, <clears throat> and this is usually people who haven't done a lot of research because had they done more research, they would at least sense that if they were to come 20 minutes late yeah. for a meeting with me and don't even say anything, there's going to be problems. How much money does one need to have in order to be coached by Michael Sower? 10K minimum. Okay. Yep. Just minimum. 10K minimum. Like if we're talking about programs, mm -hmm. um, I currently charge, you know, this changes, but you know, 5k for like individual session but yeah there's very few things i can help people with mm -hmm. over an individual session right so mm -hmm. sure but like you know as i put it on my website you know anything between 5 and 50k yep currently so sure. that's 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 the range right what are your thoughts when i say <coughs> michael sowa is controversial i'm definitely controversial on the controversial side i have it my whole life this is not for the show this is not to make more money and this is definitely not trying to be controversial. Yeah. I just, the way I, the way I see it, I speak my truth. Yeah. And what I've noticed, because obviously I'm not fucking stupid, right? Yeah. Um, that every now and then, all I need to do is to speak my truth for some people to get offended or find my certain beliefs to be controversial or yeah. provocative. But yeah. it, it's, I definitely make sure <clears throat> that I show this part of my personality on my website mm. because, you know, when I had that realization after yeah. a year and a half, um, when I thought I'm playing it too safe, mm. I definitely make sure that I, I communicate that, mm. but I wouldn't do that if I didn't think that that's really who I am. And if people are gonna, if people are gonna come and, and meet me with the initial consultation, they're gonna pick up on that vibe anyway. So yeah. I might as well pre-frame it. Yeah. So, by doing so, first of all, I can make sure that my people will resonate with me. Yeah. Because, you know, 
if I'm a little bit crazy, guess what? Most of my clients are as well. Exactly, if, they're your people. That I, have, I don't have a single, I have a, uh, like around 15 clients right now, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't have a single client who is politically correct. Right. I don't have a single client right now who is who wouldn't be seen as controversial by the society, right? Yeah, They're not exactly. necessarily as quote unquote crazy as I am, but they dig that about me. They feel safe. They feel like they can tell me, they really fucking, t- you know, they know they can tell me anything mm. and I wouldn't judge them. I'll give you an example. It didn't happen, yeah. but <clears throat> um, this female client told me once how, don't know how we got to talk about, but she basically shared with me how she feels very safe in this coaching space with me because she feels like she could tell me anything and I wouldn't judge her. Mm-hmm. And I said, thank you for sharing. And I said, listen, you're absolutely right. And I, and I thought about this like example, extreme example. I said to her, listen, if you show up here today and you told me that you killed your husband in the morning, my first re- reaction question would be, what the fuck did he do? Mm, yeah. I would be like, you did what? <laughs> Like what, what? Must have had a reason. Yeah. What the fuck did he do? Did he fucking have tea? Did he have tea from your fucking favorite <laughs> mug or something? That would piss me off as well. I would kill the motherfucker myself. Right. So, 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 so. This is particularly important when you deal with people mm. I deal with who they don't murder their husbands, mm, mm. but they and they're not criminals. Mm. But it's like uh, what the head teacher said to Richard Branson: "You are you are you either going to be a millionaire yeah. or a criminal." Yeah. So my clients, myself included, if I couldn't be a successful entrepreneur, mm. I would be more likely to be a criminal of some sort as opposed to doing nine to five yeah. and hate my fucking life. I would rather fucking roll the dice on this bad of boy course. here than just do this. For all of our listeners who are scared of criticism, mm-hmm. and I know there are a lot, especially sure. in the coaching space. At the Coaching Masters, we have, of course, many students. We've actually qualified over 7,000 people to become oh, wow. coaches. Really, really very proud of that. Mainly in the UK or, or uh, mainly international? Mainly in the UK, yeah. yeah. We actually have students from 87 different countries, but mm-hmm. like a big part of our following is in the UK. Sure. One theme that we notice a lot of yeah. is the fear and the apprehension around putting yourself out there that much and being yourself on that level due to Mm. criticism, whether it's comments on a Facebook post, whether it's just general hate, whether it's just criticism from family, you know what it's like, right? Why should our listeners not be afraid of that and not be worried about that? Okay, so first of all, let's make one thing clear. If you've never experienced criticism and you were not even remotely concerned about it, there'll be something fundamentally wrong with it. Right? You will be some sort of psychopath, sociopath, or extreme narcissist. Yeah. It's human and it's healthy to not to want to experience criticism. Sure. I don't like to experience criticism, yeah. but I've concluded that I need to be okay exposing myself to it in order to reach my ultimate goal of being the highest paid coach in the country. Yeah. Because apart from hurting someone, I knew that I was prepared to do anything to reach that goal yeah and equally right now apart from hurting people i'll be prepared to do <clears throat> excuse me anything to maintain that status yes so if sally came along it's like, okay this guy is like what or this woman is like what fuck okay canceling all the dates going back to working seven days a week i would do whatever it takes yeah yeah, right? yeah, yeah. having sex with a guy i would do whatever it <laughs> takes right <clears throat> or two guys and you know at the same time so because that's how committed I am yeah, and yeah. have been and I still am to to my goal. And yeah. it's like, why is it so important for you to like dominate, to be like the number one? Mm. I can't fully explain. I don't know. Yeah, it's just part yeah. of my fucking DNA. I don't know what it is. Like I have to be the best. I'm a competitive person. If I was in in sports, yeah. if I was a tennis player, I would be thinking about winning Wimbledon, not just like, mm. I hope one day I can get qualified. It's just, you know, it just happened to be personal coaching for me, but I know mm. I'm, I'm certain that I would apply the same type of mindset to just about anything, right? Yeah, I love that. So um, it's human to not want to experience that. We are hardwired to want to belong, right? But here's the good news. After a while, you stop giving a fuck. Mm. It's only the first comments, first few comments, Liam, I've experienced so much self, like I've created it. It's not like people were picking on me, right? Like I know why it happened. Yeah, yeah. 
I've experienced so much abuse, <laughs> verbal abuse on social media, particularly on Facebook back in the day when, sure. fa when Facebook was the thing yeah. before all our fucking parents and grandparents uh, have joined, right? <laughs> I've experienced so much abuse that there's absolutely, and the same in my dating life, like, oh, you're such a, there's absolutely nothing anyone could say to me now yeah. that would make me feel bad about myself. Good man. I don't give anyone that power. Only I have the power, only I have the power and permission to make myself feel bad about myself. I don't give you that power. I don't give anybody that power. Yes. Right? Yeah, so for you to say, oh, this guy is so full of himself, I'll be like, you're probably right. <laughs> oh, this guy is like so big headed. Yeah, you're probably right. Like, <laughs> oh, you know, he thinks he's the best. You don't fuck your right. I do. You know, yeah, so right. you don't need to like me. Yeah. But I'm gonna make you respect me. So if there's gonna be a not disrespect like online, like, I don't give a fuck. Like yeah. another thing to think about. <clears throat> Who do you think writes one-star Amazon reviews, long one-star Amazon reviews about like, you know, yeah, I bought this bottle and it meant to be, and it's a long, think about how sad of a life that person must have yeah. for them to take so much time to write a fucking one-star review about a fucking metal bottle. So true. They right? are not gonna be your clients ever in never, any reality. Never, never. You know, so now, Let's let's make one thing clear. It's not that I don't care about what people think of me. Mm. I fucking do. Sure. I really do think about what people think of me uh, or do care about what people think of me, but not people in a sense like you know, 7 billion people on the planet. Mm. I only care about what my parents think of me. Sure. Not to the point where I would edit my actions too much. Hence, I quit school at 17, despite knowing that my parents would fucking have a freak out, yeah. right? Yeah. I care about what my clients think of me, yep. right? But again, not to the point where I'll be like, oh, this person is coming late all the time, but I'm not gonna say anything because mm -hmm. I don't want to upset them, no. So you can care about what people that you care about think of you mm -hmm. while simultaneously having strong boundaries. Love that. You don't have to pick the sides, right? Love you can have both, right? I care about what my girlfriends think of me, all of them. Mm. Love that. <laughs> not just the favorite, not not just tier one. Not just the top ten. Not just no, yeah, not just the top hundred, <laughs> right? Of course, I fucking care. If they said like, "Oh my god, you made me feel that way," I'd be like, "Baby, well, I don't remember, but you know, if you remind me, like, I I wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, I don't care." Yeah, yeah. But when the fucking stranger, who is in some fucking country that you never even heard about, right, with a picture of his fucking cat as a prof, oh, as, and he's like. You know, no punctuation, no fucking, just a total fucking moron, right? <laughs> if he or she says something and you're gonna have a sleepless night because of that, oh, my friend, no. you gotta fucking grow a bit. Yeah, you've got a, a journey ahead of you. Yeah, the case. But, like, but sure enough, when I've experienced that for the first, I don't remember how many times, it's like, oh. And you know, naturally, since we are, as I said before, we are hardwired to want to be accepted and belong, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, am I, am I doing the right thing? Maybe I've made a mistake. Maybe I rushed to it too quickly. Maybe I should be like this nicey, nice coach that I've been to begin with. Yeah, yeah. And I'll give you an example. Because I promise you listeners, no matter what you say on social media, it's not gonna be as bad as this. I'm gonna give you an example of okay. like one of my Facebook posts, right? Yeah, go that got it. me, I never got 300 comments on anything I've posted. Yeah. No matter how successful, like, yeah, I've been in Forbes, I've been in yeah. GQ, like, yeah, you know, well done, 20 comments, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, I wasn't trying to, like, I knew that I'm gonna get negative comments. I, sure. did, I didn't quite know it's gonna be this many, right? Okay. So like, so like, I, I uh, you know, I've always been an overachiever and it's like, this exceeded my expectations, right? Yeah. Yep. But it was a simple post, right, on Facebook. I wrote, when I see a really obese person, Mm -hmm. right? Or really, I said fat, like a really fat person. Like, you know, I was thinking about like when you watch those, not that I watch it, but like, you know, uh, this really fat person in America living on a trailer yeah. somewhere that can't get out of bed, like really sure. fucking big, right? So when I see a really fat person like that, I ask myself, what happened in the childhood that made them get mm. to this point, right? Mm. But that's the second question I ask myself. The first one is, how the fuck do they have sex? <laughs> okay. And I just, and you know, for me it was like, 
It's oh, a genuine fat question. Fat shaming. It's like, I'm not fat shaming. Like, some of my clients are fat. I fucking love them. It's like, just uh, curiosity. No, no, it's I just want like, to know the physics of how. Yeah, it like, I'm just a curious person. It's like, how do you do that? And, like, you know, I was talking to, like, one of my girlfriends, and she's like, oh, yes, like, I don't know how we got to talk about it, but, like, yeah, I had sex, she said, with this very fat guy once. And I was like, really? And I got genuinely curious, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. I was like, listen, and you're like, small girl, right? You know, I'm surprised that she survived it, you know, because she was so fucking petite, right? But she was like, yeah, it's just like you find a way. And she explained the process to me, right? Right, yeah. But like, yeah, the, the fat guy that she was with, it wasn't the level of fatness that I was referring to. Sure, post, sure, right? sure, sure, sure. Yeah. But, you know, and sure enough, like I remember, because the drop was so severe, like I would lose like, out of like the few thousand friends I have on Facebook, I would yeah, lose like yeah. 20, 30, from 40 this, friends from, from post. my post. And, yeah. and, and here is the thing. Back to what I was saying before. Yeah. Not a single person that was a client or a former client. Yeah. None of them, my, my people, yeah. have commented negatively. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The comments were almost exclusively from people I didn't even know existed. Sure. I didn't know. They never liked anything. They've never commented on anything positively. Mm. They were just waiting for the time mm. to be heard. Mm. Right? And... And this is there's there's another layer to the story, and this is going to be something relevant to 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 you guys, to coaches listening. Yeah. Right. Um, my friend at the time, who is a, a successful coach himself, uh, sent me a very nice uh, voice note following that post, mm. and he said something along the lines of, "That's like you know many years ago." He said something like, "Of like, hey, listen, man." Um, like, I know what you're doing, like, I know your style, and I know that you're a good guy, whatever he said. But, you know, I think that maybe with a post like that, like, maybe that's like a step too far, too far, as in, I feel that you might be hurting yourself more than you're helping yourself. Okay. To which I said, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to, yeah. to, to, to tell me what you think. You know, like, I knew that he was coming from a good place. He wasn't patronizing. He wasn't mm. trying to tell me that I was wrong. He was just expressing his... Uh, doubt whether I was quote unquote doing the right thing. Okay. But here, here, here's the kicker. A few days after the message from him, so like a week or two after the post, I have a consultation with this guy. A guy in his 30s, not super fat, but definitely like yeah. seriously overweight, yeah. right? And since he didn't mention anything in the email, I asked him, how did you hear about me? Mm. And he said, you know what he said? He said, I saw a friend of mine on Facebook. I knew where he was going with this. I knew a friend of mine on, on Facebook commenting under your post. Yeah, yeah. And I said, and I said to him, and obviously I knew the answer because he was there in front of me. I said, so, so uh, you know, because he already told me, I think that he wants to work with me on the weight loss. Okay. That's one of the things he wants to work on, yeah, right? So, yeah. so I said to him, so I'm, I'm assuming that you haven't found this post offending. And he said, no, I found it funny. Yeah. And he said, and this is so fucking obvious. He said, like, I'm fat and I know I'm fat. Mm. Someone saying fat people doesn't, cause like, I, it's not like, oh shit, am I fat? Yeah. It's like. Self-aware. Yeah, so he, he found it funny. In my head, it was funny. Yeah. And here's the thing, obviously I'm not a comedian, but imagine comedians when they work on the scripts before they present it to the world, mm. oh, I find it really funny, but this could offend someone. Mm. You know, oh, if yeah. that was the case, Ricky Gervais's career, Dave Chappelle's career, Jim Jefferies' exactly. career, they'll be done. They would never have because started. every fucking sentence that comes out of the mouth is potentially offending to someone. One thing I think is really powerful about that is someone said to me a long time ago that good marketing is not just about attracting your ideal client; it's about repelling the people totally. you don't want. To and that totally, is a great totally. example of that. So, like, I, I I think I was I was trying to make that point, but then I got you know distracted in my own head. Mm. How by being positioned the way I am positioned online already, and mm. um, not only I attract my people because they 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 find similarities, mm. right? Mm. I also, exactly to your point, filter out. Exactly. Because I know, because obviously that's easy to, to measure, to, 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 to know, I know how many thousands views my website gets yeah. every month. Yeah. I know how few inquiries. There's a big difference between those two numbers, right? Exactly. And I know exactly what happens with m most people. They go on my website, which is not hard to find if you Google anything coaching related in, in the UK, especially, right? Yeah. London area. 
And there's no fucking a single word of the copy on the homepage. So that in itself, there's a picture of me. Yeah. Right? You saw it, like yeah. picture of me standing on the terrace, like yeah. I'm the shit. Right? Because yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I was thinking while standing there, right? So, so so I'm just like Yeah. And sure enough, like I don't know it for a fact, but sh but I'm assuming that many people land on that homepage. And you know the 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 definition of or like what the bounce rate is. Yeah, yeah. Homepage and they fuck up. They don't even go any further. Sure, sure. I know that my bounce off rate is very high. Yeah, yeah. Like you want it to be. Yeah. So yeah. so so like you know it's like this repelling sensation mm. of like, fuck this guy. I look at this picture. Like the wrong people. Fuck this guy. Exactly the wrong people. Yeah. Whereas my people. It. Whereas my people, you know, who are on a on a definitely on a confident, confident, self assured, yes. very ambitious side. Yeah. They're like, oh. Ah, this is different. Could be my guy. I'm interested. Let's. Yeah, oh, what, 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 where is the where is the sign up for the? Love that for the free ebook box. Where is the? Oh, this guy kind of he kind of gives a fuck. This is like my mo when I go on dates. As well. it's like I kind of give a fuck, but I like kind of don't give a fuck yeah. at the same time. And yeah, there's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my coach is like, yeah, like I can change your fucking life. Like you have no idea. It's gonna cost you a lot of money, but at the same time. I don't really need you because like I'm doing well. Yeah. So not in an arrogant way, it's just like sure. I'm being in my head, I'm being factual. Exactly. Because that's my reality. I have 15 clients right now, I think 15 exactly. I do not have capacity for more than 15. Yeah, yeah. In order to run my business the way I run my business, which is see one person a day, six days a week. Right? So that's like my my Yeah. So you know, so like I know I don't have capacity for more people than that. So that's the that's so it's structured in the perfect yeah. way for you. Yeah. So there's no like waiting list or anything like that because I I know that before I get new clients I will finish with some others and it's like I, I at this point I keep it at that you know twelve to fifteen level which is my sweet spot. You you paid me a great compliment when we were chatting before and you had said that the coaching masters is mm. bringing sexiness to coaching training. Oh sorry, I was just trying to be nice. <laughs> I, yes, sorry, Liam. But like now that we are on there, no, no, totally, totally. I was positively, so let me expand on that. I was positively surprised because I cannot recall, um, and I've, as you can imagine, I've seen a lot of those. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I cannot, I cannot recall, I'm thinking about it now, I cannot recall seeing a coach in school looking this current, this youthful, this sexy, this modern, I, yes. I, 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 I was like, what the, f Love what that. is it? How come I haven't heard about those guys? Like, Love sure that. enough, I haven't been actively looking for, yeah, like researching coaching schools. But then, you know, when you, when you said earlier today that you had, uh, so far you've had 7,000 students. students yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm not surprised. Love that. Right? Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that a lot. Do you know, do you know much about Lewis Raymond Taylor, my business partner, my co-founder? Have you heard of him before? Don't you have two business? Two, was business, it? Business yeah, sugar. there's Johnny Mitchell and mm -hmm. there's and there's Lewis as well. No, I've never, yeah. I've yeah. only seen you in a bunch of movies, but. <laughs> he's he's but an like, interesting guy, Lewis. He's really interesting. So I actually met Lewis four years ago today. Okay. 16th of February and 2019. And yeah, yeah he just he completely changed my life because at the time I had an offline coaching academy. Right. Very old school, just teaching people in the room. Yeah. And he had an online business that was helping coaches get clients and mm -hmm. build their coaching business. And he kind of introduced me to, to the online stuff. Okay. Fascinating story like he was he had a really really troubled upbringing ended up in prison as a young man young offenders institute adult prison mm -hmm. and in prison he discovered coaching right. and he decided to just completely change his life and turn his yeah. life around and he left prison and thought i need to tell the world about this coaching nice thing. that's a that's a that's a, i obviously resonate with this story oh big time and he co-founded the coaching masters with me he's mm -hmm. the ceo he's a he's a huge visionary just right. I, I personally consider him to be a genius i think he is a genius and the way that he's able to spin a thousand plus and visualize the, the future of the business. Wow. And uh, and I'll, I'll show him to you because there's, there's something I want to show you and I find this sure. really, really, really interesting. And this is this is Lewis today. And as, as you can see, like as a, as a young man who had a troubled upbringing, okay. to, to turn his life around to such an extent oh, wow. where he nearly would have ended up in prison for the rest of his life and mm -hmm. now has the wife of his dreams. And the well, that's, yeah, that's, just hugely, yeah. uh, I, I, I really love Lewis. I really respect him. You know, he changed my life in, in, in so many different ways. And there was something that he really wanted me to show you. And I can see why he wanted me to show you this. And I just find this... I find this like really, really humorous because uh -huh. of 
this was back in 2018. Yeah. And I know what Lewis is like and I know what you're like. Okay. And you're so similar, so, so, so similar in so many different ways. And you were both just destined mm. to be successful. You've both got that conviction. You've both got that vision. You've both got that ability to just say, look, I'm going to be the best. I'm going to mm. be at the top of my game. But look, I think you'll find this quite interesting. Check this out. It's actually a... Um, a couple of messages between you and Lewis back in 2018. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, so interesting reading those. Hi, Michael. I just want to say you are my kind of guy. The world. Hi, Michael. I just want to say you're my kind of guy. The world could do with more people like us around. I wonder what would it be like together. Easy there. Easy there. <laughs> you're cute, but like, you know, I'm straight. I'm straight. Okay. Let me know if you ever want to hang out. Keep doing you, man. Keep doing you, my man, Lewis. And I said, I don't hang out, I'm afraid, uh, but thanks for the message. I didn't want to elaborate, like, I don't hang out with guys, <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid, because I do hang out, but like, you know. Uh, but thanks for the message, Louis. Yeah, that sounds and like then, me. And then if you flick to the next one. Is there, uh, oh, over sorry. here, yeah? Yeah, there you go, there you go. How about plot world domination, he said. Louis, please understand that I don't need to look for friends. Sounds like me. Talk to me when, if you ever wish to explore coaching with me, all the best. No thanks, I wouldn't work with someone who is clearly incapable of building any kind of relationship with a person. And I did a uh, <laughs> face palm emoji. So I'm presuming that he has grown since. <laughs> because it's, it's so, it's, you're very similar. Mm. You're very, 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 very similar. Because uh, that's 2018, and he's like his last response. Like I, I wasn't offended by it, but like yeah, yeah, yeah. He 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 took it in a bad way back then. Sure. I sure. I would like to think for him that in 2023 he would maybe not, in my opinion, overreact. Sure. At the end. Yeah, yeah. Growth. He would just he would just he would just take it on the chin now. A lot like, of growth. Just like whatever, you know. Tons of growth. Yeah. Tons and tons Especially of growth. when you think about it, and I've been sending messages like that to people when I first started, and to this day, lots of people sending messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would argue, and it's not like I, you know, uh, I need to fucking justify anything, but I would argue that most people in my position wouldn't even reply to his message. Mm, I took the time, and I almost always do that. Mm -hmm. If somebody uh, approaches me in at least half decent manner, which is not always the case, I would at least, I, sa I said the same thing to someone earlier this week. Yeah, yeah. To a client, great guy from like ten years ago, uh, or nine years, nine, nine years ago, out of the blue, he WhatsApped me and he said, "Hey, Michael, I hope you well. It'll be nice to have a coffee with you either this month or next month." And I said, "I said, uh, Michael, his name is as well." I said, "Michael, nothing personal, but yeah. I don't do coffees. Sure. I just don't do. I don't hang out with strangers. I don't do coffees with every single former client. I had five hundred clients. Imagine half of them want to have coffees with me. I'll be yeah, fucking yeah. drinking. How much coffee can you drink, right?" <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but that's, yeah, that's definitely me. Yeah. It's, this, it, this wasn't some, uh, uh, you know, someone pretending to be me. No, that's, no. That, that, I, don't re I don't remember this interaction. For sure, for sure. I just find it, I, I find it really interesting because you are so similar and, and mm. I can so, because I know Lewis really well, that's going to be like a young gun Lewis yeah, yeah, yeah. who's like really wants that totally. success I, and really I, I wants to hear. I was there. I was yeah. there. I was, I was there. And, and, like, and I can tell you were there, like just based on the story that you've told me today. And totally, I love I your there. story, Michael, and I, lo I find it very, very aspirational. I and I, that. and that's why I find really interesting because at the time in 2018, mm -hmm. much like exactly the same with myself, you would have been that person that Lewis was like, fucking hell, that is what Yeah, yeah, so I, 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 I totally don't blame him for, like I honor him for trying, yeah. right? But I wouldn't, honor myself if I was to agree to it, even though I didn't feel like it, just because he asked me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Im imagine someone messaging uh, Bill Gates saying, listen, it would be nice to hang out uh, yeah. and maybe get some tips on how to start a software company. Like, Im imagine, right? Mm -hmm. So, oh, Michael, but you're not like, a Bill, you're not like Bill Gates. W well, it, in my mind, I, I am probably, if, if I had to decide who is better overall, when you look at all areas of life, including fitness, including dating, would I want to swap lives with Bill Gates? Absolutely not. No way. Absolutely not. Yes, is he richer? Obviously, he's richer than most people it's on the planet. Fucking everyone. But like, is, is money everything? Not to me. Yeah. yeah. Right? So who is to say that in your own fucking mind that you have 100% you have control of, mm. right? 
when it comes to like values and, and what you think of yourself, I'm not saying you have control in terms of like, you know, every thought you have control of, you don't, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of deciding who you are, who is to say that you can't see yourself as someone who's as valuable mm. or worthy mm. as the likes of Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Richard Branson? I really don't. Definitely. Hence, when people like that, so I haven't worked with people of that caliber. But for yeah, example, yeah. I've met Jeff Bezos briefly in my gym, right? Mm -hmm. A few months ago. He was staying, I use, uh, you know, I go to the gym and at the Claridge's, he was staying there, whatever, and he yeah. was, you know, we were training, like, he was there and I was here, yeah. just me and him and his personal trainer, right? So there was a bit of a, like a hi, how are you kind of conversation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't particularly surprised because like, I know myself by now. I was so cool. Yeah, I was just sure. like, yeah, Jeff Bezos, yeah. whatever, doing his thing, I'm doing my thing, yeah. right? So sure enough, when someone a little bit less successful than Jeff Bezos comes for the initial consultation, mm -hmm. like, hey, what can I do for you? Yeah, levels, right? It's levels in and, your and, mind. And, and it's not like, oh, Michael, but it's easy for you to say that because you are, you've done pretty well. I was seeing myself, not my whole life, but I was mm. seeing myself as that for many, many years already, mm. even before I really fucking made it. So this is the product of the personal development, the amount of personal development that I did on myself more than the success. Right. That you, you don't need in. to. You don't need to. You don't need to reach a certain income bracket, or you need to. You don't need to reach a certain body count, mm. or you don't need to reach a certain <laughs> fucking uh, postcode. You can start to think about yourself in that way, like today. Yes. Even if you're a fucking twenty-year-old with spots all over your fucking face, still, yeah. right? I wish I started thinking about myself like that sooner. Yes. Everybody listening to this, rewind that bit. Listen to the whole episode again, but that is so mm. very important. Making a decision as to who you want yeah, to it's be. It's making a decision, exactly. And being that person now, today, and not waiting until you get to that postcode or that body count or that level of income. But totally. you decide to be that person as of today and you have that conviction. You are an mm. amazing example of that, Michael. Mm. And there's a lot I admire about you, always have. Always will. I'm glad to call you a friend. I'm glad to know you now Thank and you, actually Luis. be able to sit in the in this Luis. room with you. So I said, Luis. My, I was, every, say, I was still, I was still thinking about that arrogant <laughs> business. Just kidding. <laughs> Liam. Every, uh, so I would. Uh, a conversation between you two would be electric. Yeah. And really, really. Weird. Next time, like, maybe. Next you time are maybe. fully, fully on the same wavelength. It's just brilliant. But as long as he signs the form that he's not gonna try to sleep with me because like this, <laughs> I'm not sure like what this guy like. I saw the picture with the girl, but like you know, I'm very open-minded, but like you know. I don't want to be like, I'm going to drop something. I'm going to be, a, you know, a danger. You I, know, I love you, Mike. You're, does anyone, people, anyone call you Mike? No, they're not allowed to. So not allowed. Not, not no, even, I just said, just one. Just that's one, one quick It's like, bike. I give you like, this is like, it's a very um, innocent thing because like, you don't know, some Michaels are okay yeah. being called Mike's. Yeah, yeah. But if, if you not, like, if you pay attention, if you, if you knew what I know being Michael, you would, you would know that with some exceptions, we either settle for one or the other. Mm. It's rarely interchangeable, mm. right? And if you really want to annoy me, like you call me Mikey. Oh, that's Mikey, like, that's, that's like... That's like punch in the face, <laughs> yeah. right? But that's like that's like an innocent kind of thing, sure, right? But sure. like when I'm talking to a prospective client, for example, scheduling a consultation, and someone would think that it's okay to call me mate. We haven't fucking met. Mm -hmm, I'm a mm -hmm. professional coach. Mm -hmm. You approach me for coaching. Mm -hmm. Thanks, mate. I don't just leave it and think like, you're not mates. I'm saying it in a similar fashion. You just saw the fucking, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I would say something like, uh, cool, but you know, lo let's don't take that mate role. Like, we, listen, we're not, we're not there yet. Yeah, they're not our roles. We, yeah, yeah, so like, let's, oh, okay, okay. And sure enough, it takes something small as that for someone to show up for that consultation, seeing you differently, right? And again, mm -hmm. it's, ba it's boundaries. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, oh, it's so bad to call somebody mate, but in a professional capacity. Yes, it's the boundary. Even with my clients, I'm friendly with them, but I don't see them as friends. I don't see them as mates, and I certainly don't want them to see me as mate. Yes, right. Absolutely. After we finish coaching, yeah. that's different, right? But to begin with, it's like no. To it, finish this off, I'd love to just tell you what I admire about you, Michael. I admire the conviction. Mm. I admire the vision. Mm. I admire the commitment 
I admire the passion and the drive to want to not only be a coach, but be the best coach. Mm. And I admire that you're, you're here having this conversation with me now because we get tens of thousands of listeners, most of which either want to be a coach or they are coaches. And I know that every single one of them are going to be hugely inspired. So I really appreciate you being here and having this conversation. Thank you for saying, uh, you know, this, this is the nicest somebody's been to me the whole day. <laughs> In what time? I mean, it's, it's, it's only 20 to one, you know, so uh, no, like, I, re I really appreciate you sharing all of that and, and for having me here. It wasn't something, I don't know, it was like, um, it's not that I say yes to all requests for interviews, right? Yeah. But even before I've done my research, energetically felt, uh, I, I energetically felt that this could be the right fit. Love the that. way I've been approached by your, yeah, I love that. The, the team. your team, right? So I was like, mm, okay. Appreciate you, Michael. Appreciate you a lot. So thanks for having me. And, and yeah, I had a, in case you haven't noticed, I had a plenty of fun. Good. <laughs>